Hi, everyone. Welcome, and thank you for joining us for a special International Women's Day edition of CADET's COVID-19 webinar series. I'm Tasha Narine, a Special Projects Officer at CADET, and one of the leads for CADET's recent Women in Leadership Discussion Group pilot. These discussion groups were gender-inclusive, employee-led sessions that provided opportunities for our CADET employees to learn from each other and discuss women in leadership-related topics of their choice in a safe space. The pilot for these discussion groups has just wrapped up and I'm really looking forward to seeing what happens next. If anyone listening in today is interested in the concept of CADET's Women in Leadership discussion groups and would like additional information, you're absolutely welcome to connect with me by email or LinkedIn and I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Today I'm speaking to you from Ottawa, Ontario, Canada, which is located on the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabeg people. For generations, the Algonquins have been keepers and defenders of this land. I recognize and deeply appreciate their historic connection to this place. And I wanna thank the generations of people who have been stewards of this land. I'd like to encourage everyone watching this webinar to think about where you are and give thanks to the people who lived there before you and cared for and sustained that land. And take a moment to consider how the issues that impact so many Canadian women are compounded and multifaceted when it comes to the issues that are faced by Indigenous women. Now, today is International Women's Day. This is a worldwide event that began in 1911. International Women's Day is not a specific group or an organization. It belongs to all groups collectively everywhere. This special day aims to connect people of all genders in the celebration of social, economic, cultural, and political achievements of women. This day also marks a call to action for accelerating gender parity. As you would expect, the achievements of women are many and varied. Women are leaders, although not always recognized. And unfortunately, this is pervasive across every field you can imagine. In Canada, there is still a gender pay gap. It is 2021 and this problem still exists. Last year, the Canadian Women Foundation projected that it would take 164 years to close the gender pay gap in Canada at the current rate of change. And the challenges go well beyond pay. There are gender parity issues in education, immigration, politics, healthcare, as well as involvement in STEM. In fact, there are issues in just about every field. Now consider again how this even further impacts the lives of Indigenous women, Black women, racialized women, newcomers to Canada, those that are disabled, and people who are LGBTQ. And COVID-19 is making things worse. The pandemic has accentuated existing disparities, causing a reversion to traditional gender roles and adversely affecting the health of many women in Canada. And the possibility of a long lasting physical, psychological, social and economics effects is very real. This was the subject of a recent editorial in the Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology Canada. And today, Kadith is very pleased to have the two authors of that editorial here to expand on the theme and share some thoughts on how we can foster gender equity during the COVID-19 pandemic. Today's speakers are Dr. Innie Chen, an Associate Professor and Clinical Research Chair at the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at the University of Ottawa. Dr. Chen is an Associate Scientist with the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute and a minimally invasive gynecologic surgeon and chronic pelvic pain specialist at the Ottawa Hospital. Her co-presenter is Dr. Olga Bougie, an assistant professor at Queen's University in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, who also works at the Kingston General Hospital. Her Twitter handle should be coming up on the screen. Uh, and if you'd like, you are welcome to follow her. Okay, so before I turn things over to our speakers, I have a couple of housekeeping announcements. The slides will be available in a PDF format on CADET's website later this week. We'll also be recording the session and making it available on CADET's YouTube channel. We'll hold all questions until the end, but you are welcome to submit questions at any time using the Q&A tab in the Zoom control bar. You can also use the Q&A tab if you run into a technical issue and CADET's event team will try to resolve that for you. 
So let's begin. I'd like to call on Dr. Chen and Dr. Buji to get things started. Thank you so much, Tasha, for the kind introduction. And Dr. Buji and I want to sincerely thank Kadith for the opportunity to speak with you today on this um, very important topic on International Women's Day. Um, and also it being nearly a year since the pandemic in Canada, an opportunity to reflect on um, on COVID-19 and women's uh, gender inequity in Canada. It's obviously a very diverse topic with um, a lot of various uh, perspectives, uh, very large topic. So um, we thought we would start by presenting to you our, our background, so next slide, um, and, and the perspective with which we are viewing this. Um, Dr. Bougie and I have a very similar um, um, perspectives in that we are both uh, fundamentally um, clinicians. Uh, we both trained as obstetrician gynecologists and in our day-to-day -day practice we see women with common gynecologic diseases and you know the operating room is our natural milieu. Um, next slide. When we are not uh, doing our clinical practice. We also make use of our background in, um, in public health training, and we have collaborated on many projects before to do with women's menstrual disorders and, um, and reproductive conditions, but we also have an interest in uh, social determinants of health. So here are a few examples of some studies looking at um, the impact of uh, income and education on surgical uh, care and surgical outcomes. And next slide. Dr. Buji herself has also um, done work on the impact. Oh, sorry, next slide. Yeah, race and e ethnicity on hysterectomy outcomes and also uh, some very common conditions such as endometriosis and fibroids. Next slide. When the pandemic hit uh, about a year ago, um, and thereafter, we were forced to take a step back from our very specialized areas of clinical focus and look uh, to outside of our areas. And, and, and what we saw were increasing reports of um, the adverse impact of the pandemic on women in all biopsychosocial domains. So, you know, increased reports of um, mental health concerns, um, gender-based violence, um, it, concerns about COVID infection among mostly female frontline workers and, um, and also staggering unemployment. And uh, next uh, slide. And this was happening not only in Canada, but also in areas around the world as well with concerns about access to, um, to reproductive care. Uh, next slide. There was also the, um, what we saw uh, with our own patients and within our own work setting among our, our colleagues and, and staff and also the real lived experiences of being women ourselves in the pandemic with each with, uh, with three children and trying to juggle, you know, um, all the changes that were happening in society and our, our you know, caring for our patients as well as, as our families. Next slide. So we recognize that we're part of um, a specialty, the, um, of, which is obstetrics and gynecology and also the Society of ob of Canada. And it is very much um, our mandate and part of our work to advocate um, for women's health. Now, most of our training has really centered on um, individuals who have been born with um, female reproductive organs. Um, however, uh, we do recognize um, the importance and, and, and the need for advocacy for women um, of, 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 um, of all types. So um, being, um, uh, cis women, trans women, uh, individuals in trans transition or, um, or, or gender diverse and, and, uh, and fluid individuals. And, um, and certainly when we look at um, International Women's Day, it is in this spirit. So next slide. So the, it is with this, um, with these uh, kind of observations and, and 
purpose that we that led us to write this ed editorial and it is what um, really may make us want to create awareness among our our colleagues and our national practice society on the very di different ways that women are, are being impacted by the pandemic. And um, we also recognize that, you know, the obstetrician gynecologist is often one of the first point of contact for, for care for women. So, so increased awareness and knowledge was, was really paramount to, to helping mitigate some of the impacts. Next slide. So it is really in the spirit on International Women's Health Day um, that we are um, approach this topic with enthusiasm and purpose. And we look forward to sharing with you our thoughts on this area. Uh, so next slide. So the goals of this talk today are to first describe the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on women in various biopsychosocial domains. These will be summarized into common elements and key themes. And then we'll also propose some strategies for advocacy for our patients and colleagues to reduce the observed inequity. Next slide. So at this point, um, you know, throughout the presentation, uh, some concepts will be used um, almost interchangeably, but we do recognize that there is distinction between equality and equity. Next slide. In terms of gender, gender equality refers to um, refers to the the idea that rights, responsibilities, and opportunities will not depend on whether an individual was born male or female, whereas gender equity refers to fairness of treatment for men and women according to their respective needs. And you can see from these definitions, therefore, that gender equity, the idea of equity, really needs to take into account the, um, the social and cultural and the, the um, biopsychosocial context as it really takes needs to take into account the needs, whereas equality is less so. And um, another way of thinking about it is equality is, while equality is the end goal, equity is, uh, can be the means to, to get there. Next slide. We also recognize that the pandemic has really um, impacted many, many vulnerable groups in society. Um, because uh, Dr. Bougie and I are women's health um, uh, care providers, our focus today is on women and certainly it is my um, interest in women's health and advocacy that led me to, to this uh, place. Um, next slide. And we do know that societies where that have a better um, a gender equality are also societies with more fairness, economic prosperity, health, happiness, peace and security for all segments of society. So how has the COVID-19 uh, pandemic impacted women's health um, and women's wellness specifically? Next slide. One of the first things we noticed early on in the pandemic was the staggering rates of unemployment. So between February and April 2020, employment decreased by 17% for women compared to about 15% for men. However, when um, the, there was a bit of recovery, unemployment fell by 2.4% for women and only 1.1% uh, for women. 2.4% for men and only 1.1% for women. So for these reasons, um, the, uh, the employment situation has been also called a she session in Canada. And here's a graph that shows basically um, uh, women being uh, a disadvantaged in, in, in most aspects of, of measurement. Next slide. Um, we compare this uh, to to the um, woman during the pandemic, during the Spanish flu in 1918. And interestingly, the, this phenomenon was not observed then. At that time, there were such staggering casualties and lack of um, employable personnel that women were actually forced to take on um, uh, roles in the workforce that were traditionally thought to be male 
roles, and this actually led to advances in in um, in women's rights and women's equity. So the idea that not all pandemics are the same, and that pandemics do occur in the context of of culture and society, and that in itself shapes the um, the the equities and, and, and changes that are seen is, is interesting. So back to the current pandemic, next slide. Why were women disproportionately impacted in terms of um, unemployment? Well, women traditionally um, work in service-oriented industries and represent the vast majority of healthcare, social services, most of educational services and accommodation and food services. So, you know, early in the pandemic, these were the first in, uh, to to uh, to be cut back and also hardest hit. Maybe not healthcare, but all the other you know frontline um, uh, service oriented uh, fields. And then next slide. The other reason is that women uh, traditionally in society um, take a disproportionate um, uh, responsibility for childcare, senior care, assistance with domestic duties and meal preparation. So when the um, when these services were lost to families, women had to take them on and, and this uh, resulted in, in, in decreased participation in the workforce. And here's a graph showing that uh, by and large, there's some correlation between availability of childcare and participation in workforces. Next slide. Um, an example that might be uh, that might uh, seem more familiar is also um, where a, a study done by Elsevier Journal and found that during the pandemic there was decreased submission for women in all academic domains, um, and also uh, for physicians and professors. Um, so very broadly, um, uh, broad phenomenon within uh, academia. Next slide. Now we've talked about the effects of the pandemic on women's um, kind of social and economic uh, well-being. However, it's important to recognize that even before the pandemic, that uh, the gender employment gap existed. Um, there were gender employment, a gender employment gap correlates with high daycare fees, and on our, on in general, women uh, do fewer hours of paid work more likely to work part time. And the most common reason cited was, um, was caring for children. And at that time, um, for every $1 that um, earned by men, women make uh, 87 cents. So what we see is this pattern of existing disparity being further widened by the pandemic. Next slide. What we also recognize is, you know, Canada is one of the countries with actually very low gender inequality compared with the rest of the world. And if this is, these phenomena are happening in Canada, we can imagine that the um, situation uh, could be much more, um, much more exacerbated in other areas of the world. Next slide. And certainly this is recognized by the United Nations where COVID-19 has deepened um, existing inequalities in economic, gender, and social fronts. And it's a time for action and solidarity. Um, news, next slide. And certainly um, in a survey of 6,000 women in 40 countries, um, women uh, reported much more concerns about income loss compared with men and more concerns about food security and also more concerns about women's health. Next slide. So far, we've been talking about uh, mostly social, um, social and economic concerns of women. And we recognize that it is within this context that women have health and well being. And um, one of the main questions we had as health uh, care providers was how does the, um, the COVID 19 uh, pandemic, how has it impacted women's health? Um, health inequity, um, in particular mental and, um, and physical health uh, being our definition of health. So um, next slide. To answer this question, we use a tool that's very familiar to Canada. We uh, 
performed a uh, scoping review and went through a variety of articles and were able to identify some which we summarized in a few key themes which we'll be showing you in a bit. So next slide. The first theme we identified was uh, COVID-19 infection. Now we knew that um, men were, appeared to be more susceptible to more severe infection early in the pandemic, but it might um, it, it was surprising for me to learn uh, back, uh, back uh, at the time that women were actually um, comprised comprise most of the COVID-19 related infections and deaths early in the pandemic. So in Canada in June 2020, 57% of COVID infections and 54% of COVID deaths were, uh, were women. Now, some of the factors were that women were um, more uh, uh, there were more women in uh, long-term care homes, but also the idea that, again, women uh, represent most of the healthcare, social services workforce. So certainly, um, for example, in it, Spain and Italy, um, the majority of infected healthcare workers were women. And also, um, later on, we also learned that uh, pregnancy also um, con confers uh, specific vulnerabilities for, for increased uh, severity of disease. Next slide. And certainly in terms of um, mental health, there was um, always a mental health gap between men and women, but we see this gap widened in, uh, in, in women during the pandemic. And we've already alluded to many, many factors that have uh, contributed to this uh, phenomenon. Um, some being social and economic, but also occupational, a lot of reports in the literature of the increased stress that women face. Next slide. Um, and then similar is, same is true for increased reports of gender-based violence um, with increased household stress and tension. We also saw significant increase in frequency of reports of gender-based violence. Also the reports tended to, put, to be more severe, often more violent and deadly and also increasing demand for emergency shelters in Canada and worldwide. Next slide. One of the areas that really hits close to home for Dr. Bushi and I is the issue of healthcare access. So during the pandemic, there was wide disruption in clinical services, including to many women specific services. And whereas we think of healthcare access as, you know, um, the availability of hospitals and, and clinics, in access is, uh, can be thought of in the broader form. So for example, the financial means to, to, to afford, um, to afford uh, treatments, um, the ability to, to get to um, your appointments, and also the time and relief from caregiving responsibilities, which has become a bigger issue since uh, women are, are not, are discouraged from bringing their children to appointments. Next slide. One of the most important areas for um, reproductive care access is access to contraception and abortion services. So um, the closure of um, services has estimated would result in 9.5 million vulnerable women and girls losing access to contraception and safe abortion in 2020. And uh, along with this, a 7 million um, unintended pregnancies worldwide. Next slide. On the other spectrum, we also found that, um, you know, with the closure of fertility clinics, women are also um, experiencing increased stress from, from this, uh, this phenomenon as well. Next slide. So taken together, what we, um, what we see is that um, there may be differential effects worldwide uh, from the pandemic on fertility, uh, depending on the country you're in with high income countries being different from low and middle income countries, and also where you are um, based on your socioeconomic situation. Um, and again, reinforcing that I the idea that the effects of the pandemic on health are modified on the 
cultural and social context in the country that you're in. Next slide. Um, in terms of obstetrical care, there is concern that delay in seeking care um, can result in possible increase in, um, in, in adverse outcomes such as stillbirth. And also, um, but the one good thing that may have come out of the pandemic is that with increased number of, of um, women working from home, there has seems to be a reduced incidence of preterm birth. Next slide. Whenever we think of timely access to care, we also think about um, cancers because um, uh, with, uh, with delaying care, um, there can be progression of disease. So this has certainly created a lot of stress among our, um, some of our patients. And, um, and, and there are certain um, cancers of the reproductive tract um, if, to which women are, are, are particularly more, more anxious about. So breast cancer, ovarian cancer. And early in the pandemic, you know, more than half of women had can or individuals had cancer care appointments canceled, postponed, or rescheduled. Next slide. While we always think about um, cancer and malignant disease, you know, Dr. Bougie and I also um, our, our focus is is really on um, menstrual disorders of women, which can be very debilitating. And um, you know these disorders are commonly overlooked. So up to a third of women experience menstrual bleeding disorders. Up to um, a fifth of women can experience menstrual pelvic pain. Majority of women will develop fibroids at some, in, during their lifetime. And 10 to 15 percent of women are estimated to have endometriosis. And often women have to um, miss work or miss school because of these conditions. So if they're not accessing appropriate care for these conditions, this can also lead to, um, to, to, um, to a, a barrier to participation in, in, in employment. Next slide. And as we were going through the literature, we also found that there was um, evidence of increased stress among um, transgender individuals uh, having um, restricted or delayed access to their care as well, which was also uh, causing additional stress. So really this idea that um, healthcare access was, was causing um, increased stress in all um, domains and including domains that were specific to, to, to certain gender. So next slide. So when we put this all together, um, we see that several themes emerge. Um, what I have ex presented are specific examples, but when you put it together, we see that the COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated inequities for women that have existed even prior to the pandemic. Um, the next theme is that assessing the impact of the pandemic on women's health needs to take into account the social, cultural, and economic factors intimately tied to women's health and well-being. So as an example, even something thought to be very much biological, such as COVID infection, is very much tied to a woman's occupation. Um, and also the idea of access to, um, to healthcare is very much tied to a woman's socioeconomic situation and also her ability to take time off work or, or have someone else watch the children. However, women may also be differentially impacted by restricted healthcare services due to susceptibilities based on reproductive organs. So in addition to um, other health conditions, women have additional susceptibilities due to um, their ability to experience unintended pregnancy or diseases of the reproductive organs. And when we consider mitigating measures uh, to reduce inequity in society, uh, we must take into account the biological, social, cultural, and economic factors. So um, with those summarizing statements, I now wish to invite uh, Dr. Olga Buji to provide some uh, thoughts and perspectives on how to uh, how to do better and mitigate, mitigate some of these inequities for, for women. 
Thank you very much, Dr. Chen, for providing such key examples of how the COVID-19 pandemic has had a significant impact on women's health. Um, this is a concern that has been recognized by a number of global as well as national organizations. And so moving forward as we continue to um, manage the pandemic and as well as plan for the recovery, we'd like to share some of the key concepts and themes that have come out from global and national organizations that we can use to promote gender equity um, and like you said, do better. So first we need to ensure that as we're presenting data surrounding COVID-19 and those statistics that we're using a gendered lens when we look at that data, we need to engage and ensure that women are represented in the key decisions being made. We need to care for the caregivers, which are more likely to be women. As you mentioned, uh, recognize the increase in gender-based violence and prepare for this. And also it's important to maintain core health and education services as we move through the pandemic. Next slide. So I really like this concept of strength in numbers. I think this has been a key theme generally as we've you know, been in this pandemic for a year now that uh, we bring strength in numbers um, to, to fight the pandemic together even while apart. And I think this certainly applies for women as well. We can have strength in number in terms of number of individuals and groups. And it's wonderful to have this international representation here today, ensuring that those numbers are diverse and representative of the population that we serve. We want to have strength in numbers in terms of the statistics and the data backing up our decisions and strength in numbers in terms of funding as well. So next slide. So just to look at each of those concepts a bit uh, more closely, um, I think we're very fortunate today, and uh, maybe it's a little bit of a double-edged sword to have such a breadth of data available and statistics with real life statistics, um, you know, looking at um, the uh, John Hopkins COVID tracker um, of COVID related statistics, but we need to ensure as we're making plans and having those statistics back up our uh, decisions that they are disaggregated by sex and other markers of inequity, uh, both at national and subnational levels. We need to have data presented that's accurate, timely, and reliable. And I think particularly important today um, to have that data presented in a responsible and um, mindful fashion. You know, as you and I are statisticians we, and uh, epidemiologists, we can certainly appreciate that um, data can always be presented kind of for both sides of the argument at times. Um, and as we translate our findings um, to the public, we want to ensure that, uh, again, that's done in a responsible fashion. Next slide. One resource that I wanted to draw attention to that uh, I found particularly helpful, even as we're uh, pre preparing this presentation, um, is this uh, gender data tracker that really looks at the questions that we're examining today, which is women in COVID-19. Uh, this is an effort by the United Nations, but they really bring together a number of resources looking at COVID data, again, a closer examination of why some equities uh, exist, both at a global level and then with specific national examples, including Canada and some of the other nations that are represented here today. Um, and then again, looking at resources and recommendations of how we can improve and advocate for gender equity as we move forward. Uh, next slide. Again, as we're planning the pandemic response and planning for recovery task forces, we need to ensure that um, leadership with it, every organization in terms of government and healthcare um, and business is diverse and that takes cognizant thought. We know that often the leaders that serve their population are not necessarily representative. Um, and so today specifically, we wanna ensure that um, women and minority groups and that their opinions and needs are, uh, are thought of and represented in those, uh, key decision, um, those key decisions that are being made. Next slide. You know, I think we can't talk about COVID-19 and women and not look into uh, this theme, which has been so central, and that is the theme of caregiver burden, uh, which is uh, one of the key um, factors that have led to the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on women. Uh, we know that women are more likely to provide caregiving 
in, that is both paid and unpaid work. Um, and so, as you mentioned, one of the key um, advocacy points is to ensure that there's universally accessible and affordable childcare and long-term and elder care. And um, you know, this was certainly a concern before the pandemic, will continue to be a concern after the pandemic, but the lockdowns that happened really, really exacerbated um, this issue. Um, one positive that I, thing that I can share from a, a local point of view in Ontario, when we had our more recent lockdown and schools were closed again, childcare was deemed an essential service. And so families still had access to that. But again, that's something that needs to be prioritized. We also want to ensure that workers in childcare and elder care, which are more likely to be women, are appropriately remunerated. We know that often those workers are more likely to be vulnerable populations. Um, and because of the essentially the, uh, the wages that they make, they're often forced to take second jobs and that may put their health at risk. Um, and certainly that's been seen in COVID-19. Next slide. Another lens through which we can look in terms of uh, the caregiving that women provide is looking at frontline health and social workers. And again, we need to advocate that these individuals have equitable access to training, especially during this pandemic, as they've been asked to take on many responsibilities, which aren't their primary area of focus. We need to ensure that they have access to PPE. Um, this is probably a bit less of a, or gratefully, a bit less of a concern at this point, but I would argue that, you know, we can uh, look at vaccine administration and make sure that there's equity um, in the principles of that. Um, and the other essential product that really needs to be considered at this point, again, is psychosocial support uh, for individuals who've been working in an extremely stressful environment for the last year. Next slide. Gender-based violence, again, is not a new concept. You know, certainly Canada, uh, I have highlighted here, has an action, a national action plan um, to prevent uh, gender-based violence and support the survivors and their family. Um, this action plan was developed in 2017. And next slide. Um, certainly has been recognized in Canada that an increase in gender-based violence has been seen through the pandemic. And so the Canadian government has provided additional funding in May. And then again in October, next slide, um, with reflection uh, that a portion of that funding is dedicated to specific vulnerable populations in Canada being the indigenous people uh, in their homes. And next slide. I think it's also very important that we recognize that the funding is really, really integral in obviously helping uh, decrease gender-based violence and care for the survivors of gender-based violence. But we also want to uh, use this opportunity to examine the social and economic roots that lead to gender-based violence and, um, and lead to the disproportionate increase during the pandemic in this phenomenon. And part of managing that is uh, commitment and resources and training and supporting uh, staff and volunteers working um, in, these, uh, in these areas. Next slide. And again, you mentioned certainly access to healthcare, which has many, many different avenues and, uh, and views needs to be supported. Um, this is across the board and is not necessarily women specific, but we need to be cognizant again of the special considerations, uh, particularly when it comes to sexual and reproductive health. We need to be cognizant of the barriers that women may face in accessing care. And again, when it particularly uh, regarding their sexual and reproductive health that many times they need to access care in a timely fashion. Um, and this needs to be uh, addressed as we move through the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, the increase in mental health concerns in women uh, that was seen to be much, much higher than men. Again, many of those services were closed or had restricted access. So again, we want to promote access to uh, mental health services as we move through uh, COVID-19. Next slide. 
education needs to be prioritized as well. We've learned actually from recent pandemics and our experience in, uh, with Zika that women's educations in particular may be more significantly impacted than men's. Um, certainly a large portion of education, a lot of uh, post-secondary education has shifted to a virtual platform. And I think it's important for education providers to reflect if women are able to access uh, that type of education um, in the same fashion. Again, we need to be cognizant of responsibilities of caregivers as well. And Dr. Chen also brought up, uh, again, the um, academic productivity, which has been significantly more impacted uh, for women than men. Um, we have certainly seen this in all this, you know, STEM uh, related um, faculties, uh, but I would argue that, you know, the same trends are probably seen across the board from many other workplaces as well. And this may actually have significant lasting uh, implications for women, right? It's not just a year um, the, as we look at promotion, um, th those, um, those considerations need to be included as well. Next slide. So finally, as we're getting close to wrapping up, you know, I think we can all discuss at length and have all witnessed the significant impact of COVID-19 in our own lives and in the society that we live in. But as we move forward, I'd like to introduce this concept of really, uh, you know, Har harvesting the silver linings and um, looking at the positive side and seeing if we can come out of this with post-traumatic growth. Uh, post-traumatic growth is a concept that two psychologists, uh, Dr. Tedeschi and Calhoun developed in the 1990s, recognizing that some individuals move through adversity and specifically in managing that adversity actually come out and function at a higher level in the end. And I think a really wonderful example uh, specific to this is when the Dr. Chen provided looking at the influenza pandemic and what that did for the feminism movement. And for through necessity, women entered the workplace in many male dominated fields at that time. They proved and showed their um, worth in those workplaces and then were able to advocate uh, you know, for equal pay and equal rights. And obviously we're still working towards that, but I would argue that um, the Spanish or the influenza at that time actually was a, a key turning point in, in uh, women's movement. And hopefully we can harvest uh, some of the same from, uh, from this adversity as well. Uh, so these are some silver linings that have been presented as, uh, you know, individuals have been surveyed during a COVID-19 pandemic. Um, the gift of time, I <laughs> argue, is, uh, is one that is probably, uh, we can argue on both sides, but I think what the pandemic has asked us to do is really uh, to reflect uh, our values and where we spend our time, which is our most precious resource, and, and realign to, uh, to use that time in a way that really uh, best serves us, um, as well as some of the other um, silver linings highlighted there. You know, a way to connect, we've learned to be creative, and I think this is a bit of positive outcome as well. Uh, next slide. Uh, Erica Pimentel is an accountant who's published uh, she, uh, through her PhD work on this concept that the COVID-19 could have a positive lasting impact on workplace culture, right? We've really changed, uh, you know, the meeting room and the boardroom. And although many of us, I would say all of us miss connecting in real time, um, there are advantages to being more flexible uh, in the workplace to bring our more authentic self uh, to, to these presentations and meetings and workplace. And that can be certainly seen as a positive and maybe um, more advantageous for women. Um, again, looking at that equity, uh, piece to get to equality as an end mean. Next slide. And finally, I think one way we can promote gender equity is to really, really celebrate um, many of the key women leaders um, through this pandemic. And certainly we can spend the whole day today doing that. And we could have spent the whole presentation uh, discussing um, and celebrating women leaders uh, in this pandemic. Uh, so I just wanted to highlight some key examples. Um, we're all, I'm sure, familiar with New, uh, New Zealand's Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern, uh, who's been very much celebrated for her um, outstanding response in leading the country through the pandemic. Uh, 
and next slide um, on our Canadian national level. We're very proud that uh, more than half of the chief medical officers of health um, are women leading Canada through this position, uh, through this pandemic, certainly a position that uh, I can say I don't envy and they've really done a phenomenal work in each of their jurisdiction, making difficult, important decisions every day and, um, you know, providing excellent examples of leadership. And next slide. Um, as we have vaccines uh, coming in, uh, obviously, which are a key turning point in this pandemic, we again want to celebrate uh, some of the key developers of those uh, vaccines. And this is Dr. Corbett, who's the lead vaccine developer for Moderna. Um, and I think important to recognize this, especially because this is a field that was traditionally more male dominated as well. Next slide. An example that's really close to us, obviously, is really the takeoff of virtual care, uh, which was around before the pandemic, but uh, certainly with uh, physical distancing and lockdowns, virtual care just took off. And again, we hope that uh, this may be more advantageous for women in helping them gain access to care. I think certainly it helps us promote um, the value that we deliver as now patients, you know, don't have to take time off their work or find childcare, but we can really access uh, and provide care to them uh, in a much more uh, diverse fashion. Next slide. So to conclude, we certainly have discussed today that COVID-19 pandemic has disproportionately impact women through a number of mechanisms and it's important for us to recognize and be cognizant of this. It's imperative to consider the impact of the pandemic through a gendered lens supported by specific and reliable data and that management and recovery efforts must consider principles of gender equity in their policy and action. And so again, next slide, thank you so much uh, for being with us today, for listening and for Gaddis for inviting us um, to the stock. We're very, very proud to present this, uh, this uh, topic, which is very near and dear to our hearts, uh, particularly on International Women's Day with this panel. Thank you very much. And we hope uh, there are some questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Chen and Dr. Bougie for your very insightful presentation. We'll now open the virtual floor up for questions. And as a reminder to our attendees, if you have a question, please send it along using the Q&A tab in the Zoom control bar, and we'll take as many as we can. So let's start off with a question for Dr. Eni. If you had to choose one women's health disparity to address, what would it be? I think that's a great question because, you know, there obviously are so many um, aspects to, to, to this uh, topic. Um, <clears throat> from the day to day, what I see the most uh, are women affected by, you know, their reproductive organs and, <clears throat> and menstrual disorders. And really my gut feeling is to say, you know, we really need to uh, advocate for women's gynecologic conditions and make sure there's great access and no barriers to their seeking care. <clears throat> However, in, in preparing this presentation and, and in our in our work with um, with Dr. Bougie, it's become clear that you know women's health really depends on their whole <clears throat> um, overall biopsychosocial well-being. So, um, what's become clear is when women are empowered, when they have the means and the um, either the knowledge and the financial resources to advocate for themselves, they will do so. So, as much as I want to focus, you know, put the shine the spotlight on menstrual disorders. I I do recognize that ultimately it is their empowerment that's going to let lead <clears throat> lead them to advocate for themselves. Okay, thank you so much. Um, the next question asks, how can we keep the conversation going when it's not International Women's Day? <laughs> Perhaps Dr. Bougie would like to take this question on. Uh, thank you so much. I think, uh, you know, in reflecting now that we've been in the pandemic for a year, one thing that we have seen during this pandemic is really a close, a closer lens and examination and, and some difficult conversations regarding inequities when it pertains to women as well as uh, other groups as well. And I'd like to say that, you know, when we talk about inequities in other groups as well, they're often um, 
compounded in that, you know, we talk that if individuals have uh, are part of two minority groups, they're even more vulnerable. And often, um, you know, minority groups, when we look at race or age um, or, or other uh, factors are also women that are more impacted uh, within those groups. Um, so I think just as we can make decisions which are less kind of panic driven at this point, as we make decisions, um, you know, moving through the pandemic, and uh, planning the recovery process that it's really important to keep those um, that lens of is this decision going to be equitable across the board in different uh, groups and population that we serve um, and when if that pertains to women but also other minorities as well is important. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, another somewhat related question to that asks, do you have any stats on how the pandemic has affected women with disabilities and any differences in race and culture and how that's impacted women? Um, this participant stated that they know that a lot of provinces don't regularly collect this type of data. So just wondering if you have any comments on that. So that can be for either uh -huh. Dr. Bougie or Dr. Chad. Um, I think that uh, Dr. Buji alluded to the importance of collecting data and, um, you know, sex and gender is one area where it's important to collect data, but it's also important to collect data on other vulnerabilities as well. We do recognize that there are a multitude of vulnerabilities and disparities that have been exacerbated by the pandemic. And what we do find in the literature, like Dr. Buji was alluding to, is if a woman was also part of another subgroup, <clears throat> their vulnerability is, and, and, and the inequity is even more exacerbated. So as an example, um, <clears throat> when there is violence um, against a certain uh, ethnic group, for example, um, Islamophobia um, has, has increased uh, during this time as well, um, the <clears throat> uh, segment of that subgroup that is targeted is more likely to be women than men. Um, so uh, while, you know, we haven't presented any specific statistics, we do recognize the um, importance of intersectionality and the, and, and considering the, the, the various components of, of social determinants and vulnerabilities um, in, in this type of work. Okay, thank you very much. Please go ahead. Yeah, similarly, I'm not sure if I've seen Canadian statistics, but I know in the US they're available and as a hypothesize that we see, uh, you know, significantly greater impact of the pandemic um, in compounded minorities. So for instance, black women, Hispanic women, et cetera. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question asks, Due to the pandemic and women going through their pregnancies and appointments alone, uh, what was the impact on women's mental health and the health of the moms and the babies? Um, so in terms of looking at obstetrical outcomes and some of uh, uh, you know, the concerns that you brought up are very poignant, but I, I'm not sure if there's lots of uh, evidence to support it at this point. When we look at uh, health outcomes there in pregnancies, um, there was maybe a concern of increased uh, risk of stillbirth um, in women kind of having concerns and delaying seeking care, um, although this hasn't been shown across the board. And actually one positive outcome that we saw is a decrease in preterm stillbirth. Um, the concern of increased anxiety and not having support personnel um, is certainly one that's, uh, that's a concern. And as providers of obstetrical care, we have attempted to, um, you know, even when partners are not uh, able to present um, in person that, uh, you know, they're able to uh, be at the appointment virtually, so, so to speak, and certainly have made exceptions for exceptional situations. That's exactly it. I've certainly seen a lot more patients requesting to record the baby's heart rate or you know, calling their husband so I can talk to, you know, we can kind of three-way call. Um, and, uh, and yeah, it is very much a source of anxiety. 
Um, what we find is that the more information we provide women in advance of their actual delivery, um, the, the more we, and the more we acknowledge that this is actual um, a cause for anxiety, <clears throat> the more we can mitigate that. So I guess we can speak from our frontline experience and, um, uh, and we don't have any specific examples at this point from the, the literature to, to speak to this specifically. Okay, thank you so much. So unfortunately, we're almost out of time and we'll have to wrap up the question period. Before we go, I'd like to give each of our speakers an opportunity for a final word. So Dr. Chen, if people only remember one thing from this webinar, what would you like it to be? I think that when we think of the word woman, we must um, consider all the various aspects, not just the reproductive organs, not just the mother, not just the wife, or not just you know the the, the work that she's doing. But woman is um, is uh, is a very multi uh, faceted, um, complex uh, uh, word and and an entity that uh, that must be considered whenever we we think about. Um, <clears throat> Uh, advocacy and and um, healthcare policies. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Bougie, same question. What is the key takeaway message uh, from your perspective? Well, um, I think certainly we have all been impacted significantly by the pandemic, but we need to recognize that women and other minority groups have been disproportionately impacted. And as we plan for recovery as we plan hopefully in the next year to uh, have this done virtually when we're all traveling we need to plan that with a gendered lens and, and a recognition of the disproportionate impact on minority groups um, to to promote equality on the other side okay thank you so much so that brings us to the end of today's session let's give a big thank you to our two speakers and to everyone who's tuned in for today's webinar. A special thank you to all of you who continue to work for gender parity in Canada and around the world. And that's it for now. A short evaluation survey will open up in a new window when you exit the webinar. Please take a moment to fill it out. The webinar and slides will be posted later this week. And please keep an eye on CADETH's website for um, upcoming events. All right, take care everyone. Continue to wash your hands, wear a mask and stay safe.